Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. We've had a change of committee membership. I would like to welcome Paul McLennan to the committee, who replaces Marie McNair, and I would like to thank Marie for her valued contribution to the committee since its establishment. And our first item of business today is to invite Paul McLennan, McLennan to declare any relevant interests. Paul. Thank you, Convener. Um, I refer members to my register of interest. I'm a servant councillor, well, at least for the next two weeks, uh, and I'm also on a friend on property in East Lothian. Thanks very much for that, Paul, and welcome on board. Our second, second item of business today is a decision to take item four in private. Are we all agreed for that? Perfect. Thank you very much. We now turn to our next item of business, which is an evidence session on the Scottish Government's Child Poverty Delivery Plan 2022 to 2026. And we have two panels of witnesses giving evidence today. I welcome to the meeting our first panel, which focuses on evidence from anti-poverty groups who are all joining us remotely. Good morning. Um, we have Marion Davies, who is the Director of Policy and Communication and Strategy at One Parent Family Scotland. We also have Peter Kelly, Director of the Poverty Alliance, Claire Telfer, who is Head of Scotland Save the Children, Alison Watson, Director of Shelter Scotland, and Bill Scott, who was, is the Chair of the Poverty and Inequality Commission. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. A few um, housekeeping things to mention before we, we kick off. Please do put an R in the chat function if you would like to come in on a topic. I will ask my colleagues in the room to direct questions specifically to somebody to start us off. Um, we are going to be tight for time because we do have two panels, but we do want to make sure that we hear as much from yourselves as, as possible. So I would ask if you could endeavour in your first answer not to try and get everything you want in in that one opportunity because you're going to have several opportunities to come in. Um, so please do bear that in mind. Um, and I'm going to invite Pam Duncan Glancy, who's in the room, to kick us off um, on our first theme of, of questions. Pam. Good morning. Thank you, convener. Um, and good morning to, to the panel. Thank you for all the evidence that you've submitted in advance and also all of the work that you've done um, in this year and, and, and previous years. I know it's been um, a really tough time for a lot and still is a tough time for a lot of the people who you represent. Um, I'd like to start um, by asking um, a question of, of Bill Scott, if that's OK. Um, and I know in the submission from the Poverty and Inequality Commission that you were looking for pace, scale and increased investment. Um, and so I just wondered if you could um, tell us how, how you think the delivery plan um, compares to, to those um, expectations. Um, does it include the stronger focus on evidence that you'd wanted? And is there enough in there on social security for um, addressing the cost of living crisis now? Good morning, Pam, and good morning, convener and other members. Um, the Commission met last week um, for its first look uh, as a group at the um, delivery plan. And um, we, we were you know, quite satisfied in some ways that the, the Scottish Government has listened to the advice that we provided um, over uh, the period when the, the delivery plan was being put together. Um, it does show some evidence, I think, that um, there is a greater acknowledgement of the pace and scale that will be required, and, and the greater investment, particularly in employability, is something that, that we greatly welcome. Um, there is also evidence, I think, that the Scottish Government um, has begun to understand the intersectionality, the aspects of how poverty impacts on, in particular, women, disabled people, um, black and minority ethnic communities, etc. But also that those groups are not distinct uh, from one another. But that, that you know, for example, you know, of the hundred thousand children children living in households with a disabled person, um, there are also ninety thousand living in households with a lone parent. But 30,000 of those children are also living in a household with a disabled person. So, you know, um, if, unless we understand all the barriers that, that, that those groups face, it, it's, it's impossible really to, to assist them to, to move out of poverty. So I, I think those, that greater recognition and the greater recognition of the importance of lived experience in informing the policies and actions that the government takes uh, is also something we greatly welcome. 
and and we we do think that there has been an improvement in uh, the publication of analysis which supports the the background policy decisions made in the plan um, including the cumulative impact assessment um, modeling which shows how the Scottish government thinks the actions it takes will lead to a reduction in relative poverty to meet the interim targets um, there are of course there's areas where um, the Scottish government have not necessarily taken on uh, the Commission's advice. Um, uh, in particular, I think um, accessible transport um, and affordable transport is, is something that we believe more action will need to be taken on um, uh, to link up all the other policies, because that is still a significant barrier uh, to some people taking up um, employment opportunities. Um, so, oh. We would like still uh, to see an extension of the concessionary travel scheme to, to more people on low incomes, um, although we do welcome the extension for, for younger people. Um, also, in, t in terms of linking up how affordable housing can help to deliver uh, the child poverty targets, we'd like to see more action and, and more thought given in that area. And, and you know, whether the, the actions around employability will be sufficient on, on their own um, is, is still to be seen. Uh, as I say, we do welcome the increased investment in that area, but we think more work needs to be done with employers as well as those who are seeking employment um, to deliver on that. And um, you know, there, there is, um, I, I think, the, the phrase being coined coined employer ability to get employers to understand the barriers um, that people face in, in moving into work is, is really important and, and to work with them to overcome those barriers uh, before people move into work. Um, so you know, um, all in all, you know, we're quite impressed by by the thought that's gone into the delivery plan. Um, and it's a, it's a good start. It's certainly not the end of the process. And we do think that more action will need to be taken to meet the cost of living uh, crisis that uh, many, many low-income households are facing. And it is um, sub somewhat a contradiction, but poverty can actually be reduced um, because average income has fallen. Um, that, that sounds like, a as I say, a contradiction, but it, it's a statistical fact that if Average income falls from thirty thousand a year, twenty nine or twenty eight thousand. Then sixty percent of uh, average income, uh, median income, will also be lower, and that means that people whose you know, income has not improved at all can be lifted over the poverty line, and and therefore the numbers in poverty are reduced. So that's not what it feels like to be in one of those households where poverty may well have deepened because of the additional costs that they're facing. And, and we have to remember that relative poverty is, is largely an income measure, and it only really takes into account housing costs. It doesn't take into account energy costs or food costs. And, and to really understand poverty, we need to listen much more carefully to people with lived experience, and we also need to look at the other poverty measures, including material deprivation. Um, because I think that we will see a large rise in material deprivation over the next couple of years. I'll stop there. It, thank, that it once? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for that for that really um, comprehensive answer. It's, it's really helpful. Um, on on the point about the the income and, and income distribution and how that's affecting the the poverty rates. Um, how much of that do you think explains some of the projections going forward in terms of the modelling? Um, just, just briefly, and then um, my, I have another question, um, and I think this time it would be for, for Peter, if that's okay. Um, where the Poverty Alliance have noted that social security is not yet adequate, um, and, and members and others will know that I, I share impatience um, for, for action on that, in particular around adult disability payment and carers' allowance. Um, so I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit, Peter, about how we start to address that and what we need to do now. So a short supplementary again from Bill's um, answer, and then over to Peter, if that's all right. Um, 
definitely it has affected the poverty figures over the last couple of years. We will not, we'll not see last year's figures until next year, really. Um, again, that's, that's one of the quirks uh, when the figures are collected and when they're published. But because um, so many people were on furlough um, and therefore only on 80 per cent of their, their um, earnings, and because there was uh, the £20 a week top up to universal credit, um, many low income households actually saw their income boosted, um, you know, those that were on universal credit, while at, at the same time, many other workers had their, saw their income reduced to 80 per cent of what it normally was. And, and, that, and as furlough was still in place until November last year, um, that, will, that will continue to have an impact on the figures when they're published next year. So that, that's um, a factor that we have to bear in mind that, as I say, average income fell slightly over the course of the pandemic. And uh, at the same time, the incomes of some of the poor, poorest households rose because of universal credit top up. But of course, that's gone now. Um, and those households are very much struggling um, now with a, with a loss of that thousand pounds a year. Thank you. Can we now hear from Peter, please? Thank you, convener, um, and thanks, Pam, for the, the question as well. If I maybe go back to your original question to Bill, where um, which is what I was, I was hopefully going to come in on, it was more, I guess my initial reflections were about the. Uh, quality of the plan, the seriousness of the plan. Um, you would asked about the, the pace and scale and the use of uh, evidence and so on, and whether uh, all of that added up to, I, I guess, in my interpretation, a good tackling child poverty delivery plan. And I think um, over the piece, I think there is there's some really important elements in this plan that we need to uh, welcome in comparison to perhaps the approach that we've taken to addressing poverty or child poverty in the past when we've set out these strategic plans. The, the fact that the Scottish Government has retained uh, its approach, so the six priority families, uh, or six priority groups rather, and uh, the focus on the key drivers, I think is, is worth just pointing out that that is uh, that's significant in itself. A lot of the time over the years when we've been talking about anti-poverty strategy and what we want to see in anti-poverty strategy, one thing that we've needed to see is consistency in approach and a consistency that will go across parliamentary terms in particular. Uh, and I think what we're seeing here is the benefits of uh, the Child Poverty Act and the importance of that. And so I think uh, for the parliament and, and for all of the different parties within the parliament to retain the, the unanimity around uh, that approach is is really important. So good to see that. Um, I think, uh, like uh, Bill, I th we certainly welcome the, the publication of the evidence, uh, the attempt to to really link um, the evaluation of policies and assessment of the, pol the policies that have been introduced um, to um, to the, the changes that are trying to be made and to delivering on those uh, child poverty targets. I think to, to go directly to your question, Pam, about uh, adequacy, um, incomes aren't adequate. You know, that's that's self-evident in the fact that we have um, the levels of poverty that we have at the moment. Um, the question is, are we moving towards adequate incomes? And I think on the, the Scottish child payment, Again, as we said in our evidence, you know, to see that payment doubled um, in the, at the very start of this financial year, and then to have a commitment to have it increased by another five pounds uh, before the end of the, the calendar year is important, and it is important because it will deliver um, something quite significant if the modelling is correct, and it may well get us to to those interim targets. Not on its own, I think it's important to say that as well. Not just Scottish child payment, um, but but I, I guess in comparison to what we see happening in our social security system, our uh, reserved social security system, uh, I think it, it it sets out how our social security system can be used to address poverty, which is obviously written in uh, to uh, the Social Security Act in Scotland. So 
So that, again, is important. I think we need to see the Scottish child payment progressively increased over the remainder of this parliament. Um, we have called for £40. Pounds, um, and I think, as, as others have said, that needs to be kept under review. So we, we have a measure of income adequacy in the minimum income standards. Um, we use that minimum income standard in different parts of Scottish Government policy. So, in relation to the the, the real living wage uh, and the way that we uh, understand real poverty in Scotland, we use the minimum income standard to help us to help guide our understanding of what what is needed. Um, the the development of the minimum income guarantee we hope will be based on a minimum income standard, and that should take us towards adequate incomes. But what is important is the practical steps that we take. So, Scottish Child Payment, really important. The um, mitigation of the benefit cap, again, really important. But we are going to have to see a lot more of that, and particularly post 2023-24, uh, if we are going to get towards the, um, uh, the, the, the end in child poverty targets. Thank you. Um, I have one further question on this theme, if that's all right, yep. um, convener. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Peter. That was really helpful, and, and Bill for you, for your additional information too. My final question on this um, theme is for Claire. Um, and you, you, in the submission from um, Save the Children, you note that any delay, for example, in, in an increase to the Scottish Child Payment would put um, the targets at risk, which um, I think we, we can all see. Um, are, are you? Are you worried about that? And um, what, what do you think we should be doing for the children who are on bridging payments, who are not getting that um, additional money at all at the minute? Well, good morning, and thanks very much for having me. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the Scottish uh, child payment, I think it is really welcome that we have seen additional commitments in the plan to support families in the short term, but also building those adequate incomes over time, as we have seen. Um, I think in terms of meeting the interim targets, it is going to be really important that the focus is on delivery and we make sure that that happens. And obviously, more importantly, family, families need that additional money right now. Um, in terms of the, the bridging payment and the supporting the cost of living, um, I think we would like to see additional action taken. Um, and we would support doubling the bridging payments in the short term to support families through the cost of living crisis that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, but more importantly, thinking about how we build on the Scottish child payment over time as well. Uh, while the increases are really welcome, I think we are going to have to, it's such an important tool in the toolbox for tackling poverty that we really need to think about and keeping that consistently under review, how that can increasingly make a difference to building adequate incomes and that minimum income standard that we're thinking about in the future. So being open to further increases on the Scottish Child Payment um, during the course of this plan, I think, will be really, really important as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to move on a to a question from Emma Roddick. Emma. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, panel. Um, Bill, it's good to see you again. And I just wanted to pick up on a comment that you've made about travel and the importance of affordable travel. Um, that's obviously a big barrier for a lot of people in the Highlands and Islands. The plan does discuss the complexity of rural poverty uh, specifically, and I'm particularly encouraged by the work that's been done on housing and taking evidence from the Anchor Project in Shetland. But are there other aspects of rural poverty that you think need more attention? Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. There's, there's definitely um, areas of rural poverty that are, that are going to require um, additional support over and above um, what's already in place. Um, for example, uh, energy costs in, in rural areas are significantly higher, um, both due to colder weather and, and um, you know, the supply mechanisms that are, that are in place. Um, many rural areas, you know, uh, people living in rural areas rely on gas, uh, as you know, rather, um, you know, uh, in containers uh, rather than um, you know a, a, a supply from the mains. So, uh, for all of those reasons, um, we we really need to understand rural poverty much to a much greater extent. We we are very concerned that there's been a loss of 
um, transport services in, in rural areas in particular, again, um, which where they were already pretty scarce, um, they, you know, they've been run down even further. And um, the transport costs are, are continue to rise um, at a time when uh, incomes of the poorest households um, are, are either falling or, or are stationary. So um, th those costs can, as I say, can be a significant barrier to taking up not just employment opportunities, but training and educational opportunities as well. Um, so I, I do think we're going to, we're going to have to see um, and I know there is a review uh, taking place, but I, I do think we're going to have to see targeted action to, to try and reduce some of those costs, uh, particularly uh, for those living in rural areas, where, where, as I say, transport services are not as good as they may be in the major urban centres. Um, and, and also, um, you know, housing costs, um, again, um, <laughs> To an extent, because Scotland is a very successful tourist economy, um, uh, housing costs are rising in rural areas as well. As, as many um, what were formerly homes to people are, are, are turned into small businesses, um, where, you know, and let out um, to, to visitors, and that makes the cost rise for uh, those that continue to live and work in, in those areas. So, um, yeah. We need we need to see more affordable housing. We need to see transport addressed. We see, need to see energy costs addressed. They're just the three big headline issues, and I'm sure um, more could be added to that. Thank you very much for for that, Bill, and thanks, Emma, for that question. Um, we're going to move on to our second theme, which is roundabout employability and fair work. And to start us off, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Miles Briggs, who will be followed by Natalie Don. Thank you, convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I wanted to kick off on this uh, topic with regards to childcare um, and with regards specifically to um, barriers to work, um, because we know that is often um, fed back to us as why people can't, um, you know, go into the world of work and to what extent um, can I ask you, do you think the um, 1140 funded hours um, being delivered in the current way helps maximise um, the impact on child poverty and for people to, to realise opportunities around work? Um, I'll maybe start um, with yourself, Marion, and then if anyone else wants to come in, can you put an R in the chat? Yes. Um... Uh, firstly, thanks very much um, for the invitation to, to give evidence today. Um, single parents make up a quarter of all families in Scotland, and uh, I think there's around about four in ten of children in poverty live with, with a single parent. So they're a, a key group in the child poverty uh, delivery plan. And uh, um, yeah, as, as part of um, you know our work around this, we have consulted with parents and. Um, we, we've just completed a huge survey um, of 250 um, odd single parents re replied to. It. Um, they've identified for us the key areas of importance, um, one of the top ones being, being childcare. Um, and, uh, so they've fed back to us their, their concerns. And, uh, like we've got over 110 pages of um, content of single parents telling us um, about their, their experiences at the moment. Um, and uh, yes, childcare is one of the, the, the top things that um, that they raise. Um, so childcare is crucial in terms of single parents being able to, to access um, further education, employment, um, being on their own with their children, so um, the, the, the 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 new strategy um, does obviously cover um, the the provision of uh, of childcare, the the, the um, 140 hours of funded childcare. Um, we think um, you know this is this is a very positive move, um, but we believe uh, that uh, we need to do more. Um, so the, the feedback from parents tell us that childcare is not flexible enough. It doesn't match the requirements of the labour market. Um, official um, childcare is, is is rigid in terms of its delivery. 
Um, so what, what we would like to see our vision is that, that every child up to the age of 12 should receive funded uh, childcare entitlement, and that should be extended to 50 hours a week. Um, uh, but I think in the meanwhile, um, we would like to make sure that the childcare that is available is more flexible. Um, and that uh, particularly kind of what came through in the survey was that um, it is of disabled children, um, uh, uh, you know, perhaps need more support, more of a focus, and that they have a better access to affordable and appropriate childcare. Um, we think childcare should be seen; it should really be seen as um, a vital infrastructure investment. So, so it should be, you know, key to local economic development strategies and. Um, aside from you know the the official um, kind of mainstream childcare, we need flexible wraparound childcare, um, and you know that needs to be available during school uh, school uh, holidays. Um, in particular, that's a time of pressure for single parents who are in work, um, and even like with with older children, um, you perhaps have just started secondary school, um, you know th things for them to do while while their parents at work. Um, so yeah, moving in the right direction, but um, I think probably an increase in uh, the pace of uh, development of the availability, and you know, big thing that came through was cost. Um, a lot of parents were saying they couldn't afford um, the cost of childcare, and particularly kind of out of school care um, was a big issue that came through in our survey. Th thank you. Does anyone else want to? Come into that. No, I wanted to um, just expand that um, a bit more with regards to access to training and skills, um, because I think a lot of the college sector, for example, have put in place um, additional facilities. Now that's been impacted clearly during the pandemic. But I just wondered if you had any um, anything further to add on on how that sort of flexibility is used for people to um, upskill and access college places where they're available. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to come in on that or. If not, happy to move on, Convener. Bill's got his hand up. Bill. Yeah. Um, for, it's just following on from what, what Marion's um, just said. I, I think to understand poverty um, in Scotland, we have to understand the gendered aspects of it as well. Um, we talk about low parent families um, and, and, you know, that 90,000 children are, are living in and parent families uh, who are in poverty, um, but actually, 97% of those families are headed by a woman, um, um, and therefore, you know, the barriers to employment, to increasing skills, etc., disproportionately affect women uh, because of their care and responsibilities, um, and we need to see a coherence and joined up policy thinking. And, and I do welcome the plan has made steps towards linkages across policy areas, across government. But for example, the 20 minute neighbourhood idea is a really good one uh, and, and environmentally, um, but it's also a really good one in terms of childcare, because it's no good if the childcare is sited well away from where um, you know, a, 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 lone, a lone parent uh, it lives, so that they have to travel to the childcare, and as Marion said, often inflexible in hours. And then they have to travel back to pick up a child, etc. If the childcare was was closer to them, within walking distance, etc., it makes it much much easier um, to to fit um, the working day around it. And and obviously the increase in in uh, you know, funded childcare is, is greatly to be welcomed. I think we still see whether that will have the impact it could have over a longer period. I think it will take time to to have that sort of impact, but but it is to be welcomed. And and also the the planned improvements in after school uh, childcare um, for for those children that have reached school age uh, are also to be greatly welcomed. We want to see more detail on that uh, at the Commission um, to see how that, that's going to work in practice. But it could, again, be very valuable, because for a lot of families, and again, you've got to remember, two-thirds of the, uh, the children living in poverty are in working households. And the real barrier for those households isn't that they're, they're not in work, 
it's that they're not working sufficient hours to, to lift them o over the, the poverty line or they're on such low pay that they're not uh, lifted over the, the poverty line. So if we can improve the number of hours that those households can work by improving childcare, then we can help uh, lift those households out of poverty. I've got quite a few people want to come in now, so if we can um, go to Claire, then Peter, and then back to Marion, that would be great. Claire, thanks. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to add to what colleagues have said, I think we welcome the progress that's been made in extending early learning and childcare. Um, that's, it's a hugely complex task to develop a childcare system that meets the needs of all families. Um, and it is great that we're taking great steps towards that. I think, as others have already said, whether um, it will take time to see how that um, is, is impacting on parents' ability to take up employment. But I think we also need to remember get the balance right between delivering that childcare in a way that supports children's development, particularly in the early years, and supporting parents to take up work or more hours. And what we hear from parents, we spoke to a number of parents, particularly with young children, um, to help inform what they thought the priority should be for the plan. And I think it's fair to say that childcare is still seen as more of a barrier to work than an enabler for most parents on low incomes. And some of that's um, perceived and some of its actual challenges, particularly fears around unmanageable costs. The support around paying for childcare is really complex um, and being able to access um, that actually it becomes inaccessible. Um, it kind of puts parents off because they don't understand or aren't aware of there's a lack of information in terms of places available locally um, and how they can be supported to pay for or take up childcare. Um, so I think that there's a number of challenges there in thinking about how we make sure support is available. And I think part of that is about providing um, holistic family support and tailored um, approaches to supporting employability, which I think come through really strongly and are really welcome in the plan. Um, as are the promises in the plan to extend free childcare further for younger children and out of school care. And I think the lessons that we've learned in delivering such a complex extension in hours, we really need to kind of take note of those in, in the next steps for building that childcare system that will enable all families um, the choice of, of work and balancing that with childcare and making sure that that is flexible enough to meet the needs of parents working different shifts and um, different family needs. Um, and I think delivering that at scale is, is an is, is a challenge and it will take time. So we, we really don't have time to waste in terms of starting to think about the specifics and how we're going to start delivering that. So while the promises in the plan are really welcome, I think the next steps in setting out what are the goals going to be, how specifically do they relate to child poverty, um, and what are the time skills for delivering on that are going to be really important for parents in terms of the choices that they can make around uh, work and caring for their children. Can we hear now from Peter? Thank you, Convener. Just to, to come back very quickly on a couple of the points, because Bill and, and Claire have, have already covered some of them. I think uh, in, in our consultation around the plan, uh, we, we similarly heard very clearly from community organisations about the importance of childcare and the importance of extending the offer uh, of, of childcare so that it begins earlier for, for younger children. Um, so that, that's really important. But I think in what's in the plan in terms of uh, the, the offer to parents and that connectedness with um, the, the dedicated key worker that will help support access childcare and will take into account issues like transport and so on, that's, that's really welcome. I think we, we're going to need to see that developed really quite quickly in terms of uh, the implementation of that new offer. So that's that's a critical part. And I think in terms of how we do that, we need to draw on the lessons of what's worked in the past. That we're not starting from zero here. Um, so looking at programmes like Working for Families that, that were around quite some time ago now, more than uh, more than ten years ago, maybe even fifteen years ago, uh, and where there was a, an offer of uh, holistic integrated support to help uh, parents return to the labour market in a way that, that worked and that actually had 
um, an impact in terms of uh, sustainability. I think we need to draw on those kind of lessons and, and not think we have to start again um, with, uh, with the develop of, development of new uh, childcare arrangements. And can we now hear from Marion? Just, um, I wanted to make a general point about um, single parents' access to further and higher education, and uh, it is linked to childcare. Um, there isn't really enough childcare to facilitate that. But beyond that, the point I wanted to make was that it's actually very hard for single parents to move into further and in higher education now, um, because when their child is three. Um, if they are in receipt of benefit, then they are required to look for work. Um, so any lone parent they may, may wish to, to sort of take up further education is left with a, a, a very difficult decision because um, uh, they are still required to be available for work. So I think if there was research that looked at the number of single parents that went into further and higher education, we would find that there has been a um, yeah, a catastrophic drop in 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 those numbers, and and you know that is very important because most single parents work in 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 the areas of the economy that are low paid, and um, you know it pay, plays a part in the poverty that single parents face. Um, so therefore, you know to to, to help to tackle that, um, single parents need access to to improve their qualifications. Um, and to you know to 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 be able to move into better paid work, so all these things are connected up. <clears throat> and um, I think, lastly, in relation to childcare and transport, um, these two things are crucially connected because, as a single parent, if you have a couple of children, um, you're out at work. You've got one going to nursery and one going to to school. And um, the connectivity of transport is crucial for that to be able to get um, to get to all these places. Um, uh, before you start work, perhaps at nine o'clock in the morning, um, and later on in the day when you do the pickups. So, just come back to transport and the points that Bill made about how important that is. Thank you very much for that, Marion. Um, I'll now move on to questions from um, Natalie Dawn, and then over to Pam Duncan Glancy. Natalie. Thanks very much, convener, and thank you to all the panel this morning. It's really good to have you with us. Um, I've got a couple of questions on this. I'll begin. Um, we've, we've touched on some of the priority groups already, um, single, single parent families. Um, do you feel that the delivery plan has done enough to support employment for the priority groups? And do you feel that the Scottish Government has utilised um, its devolved powers fully in this plan? And in your view, do you feel that efforts could be enhanced further with the devolution of employment law? And could I put that to Bill, please? <laughs> Good questions, uh, Natalie. Thank you. Um, whether enough has been done, only time will tell. Um, uh, I think the, the increased, in, as I said, the Commission's point of view on the increased investment and in employability is it looks it looks good. Um, it looks as though it's addressing some of the issues for those priority families with you know, both targeted and um, holistic support being provided. To the, to the families um, uh, to, to assist them to overcome some of the barriers. Um, however, some of those ba barriers are structural, and we need to see more action taken on, on those structural barriers um, um, to taking up employment. And we have to, we have to say you've still got far too many low-paid jobs, and, and people become stuck in those low-paid jobs, and for some of the reasons that Marianne's pointed out, that um, improving skills is, is also an important uh, aspect in moving up the career ladder, et cetera. Um, and we would like to see, um, you know, particularly probably more support for disabled people um, and their families, um, because um, they're the largest single group of uh, children living in poverty are, are in households, either a disabled parent or a or a disabled child. Um, so, you know, childcare, very important that that um, addresses the additional needs of uh, disabled children, um, but also that um, the employability service that's offered is more along the lines of indiv individual placement and support. Um, individual placement and support has been really, really successful in moving um, people away more, you know, 
medium to severe mental health difficulties into work. Uh, it's got a very high success rate. And, and it works with both disabled people and employers um, to address barriers. So it works with the employers to address the barriers that they may not even be aware of there uh, in the recruitment process um, and in the workplace um, to make sure that the workplace is truly accessible and that the recruitment process is truly accessible. And, and then it tries to place uh, disabled people um, with those employers. And um, that holistic approach, which also addresses you know, benefit take-up, access to work, um, support, et cetera, all of that really needs, we really need to see that holistic approach in, in employability. So we've yet to see what the, how exactly the new employability funding will work, but we hope to see it more along those sort of lines. And the other thing that I would really welcome is this new parental transition fund, £15 million per year, um, which is there to address some of the financial barriers to work. And that is um, tackling some of those issues I think Marion's identified about the fact that in, in terms of childcare, you often have to pay the costs up front, but you only get the support with those costs in arrears. And, and of course, during your first month of work, you're paying the childcare costs, but you've no income. Um, and and if if it can begin to address some of those issues again, that will help many families be able to make that decision that they want to take up work opportunities. Whereas at the moment they look at it and they just say, "Well, I'm not going to be able to feed the children if if, if I take up that job because I, I just can't afford the childcare and and uh, putting food on the table." So I'm hoping again that the new and, and the commission's hoping that the new parental transition fund will begin to address some of those barriers as well. Thanks very much. Um, that actually kind of touched on one of my supplementary questions there, um, which was just involved in, obviously, I think you've mentioned employers are becoming a little bit more flexible in terms of accommodating employees who might have childcare commitments um, or e even other issues, ensuring that people in poverty have financial support to afford the tools or clothes that they might need to get to work or, or for their workplace. So, so, sorry, can I just ask... Um, can I just reaffirm, do you feel that is, that is happening just now that employers are given that extra support and are coming round to, um, to, to sort of open up these barriers for people? I don't know is the answer. I, th I think we need to see more work with employers on, on, on this, this issue. I think there's probably a role for the um, you know, Fair Work Commission, et cetera, in this area. Um, uh, but we definitely need to see more work done, I think, to alert employers to some of the removal of some of the barriers. W one of the things that's, that's been proven absolutely during um, you know, the last two years of the pandemic is that people can work very successfully from home. And that, that removes one of the barriers for a lot of disabled people who, you know, again, find it difficult to get accessible transport to and from work. or we find the journey to and from work taps their energy. So a lot of people with ME, et cetera, who you know, um, find the, the journey to work a, bar a barrier, not just the cost, but the actual physical effort involved. Um, and if they can remain at home and work um, successfully, and they can, we need to get that message across to employers that you know, hybrid forms of working now are, are much easier to achieve for many, many types of jobs and, and that should open up employment to more disabled people than before. So you know, let's hope you know some of the lessons of the pandemic have been learned by employers and, and they do begin to open up those opportunities to disabled people. Thanks, Bill. You're kind of preempting my questions because my next one was about hybrid. But no, um, you, I absolutely agree. I think there's issues with the different kinds of employment. So I know, for example, in retail, it can be quite un inflexible. Um, and I think there really needs to be a focus on making sure that we, they, we cover all areas of employment um, to make sure that flexibility is going across the board. Um, I think Peter, sorry, wanted to come in on this. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it was just this. On that question of the role of employers, and I think the, the Poverty Alliance has uh, been delivering the living wage accreditation scheme now for the last eight years or so. Um, and, and what we've seen from that, 2,500 employers who have signed up to become accredited living wage employers. So there's definitely um, 
out there amongst employers a desire to to do more and to be actively involved in in initiatives and efforts to address poverty. I think we need to go further than that. So the the restatement of some of the commitments around the expansion of uh, the Living Hours program is very welcome, and obviously we're we're delivering that as well. So. Uh, probably bound to say that it's welcome, but I think some of the some of the references in the plan to the engagement of employers in this. I mean, employment is absolutely central to tackling poverty. We spend a lot of our time talking about how employment isn't providing a route out of poverty for enough people, but what we do know is that when employment works, it is the key route out of uh, poverty for for many many people. For most people, it's the thing that keeps them out of poverty. Um, so, so we need to do much more to engage employers in in discussions about their role in addressing child poverty. If if the if the ambitions of this plan is to be realised, then they need to be much more central to that discussion. And that that can be a difficult thing to do. We've we've tried over the last few years, and Scottish Leaders Forum and others have tried to to actively engage employers in that. And it's not it's not a simple and straightforward task. But we need to do more, and we need to take a much more focused approach to that. I think the other the other question you asked was about the devolution of employment legislation. I think that would undoubtedly help. We've said that in the past, um, but I think the the engagement of employers to build on some of the really good work that's been done around Scottish Business Pledge, around living wage accreditation, and so on, to really build that uh, momentum to get employers involved in this is really important. Thanks, Peter. Absolutely agreed. Uh, no further questions, convener. Thanks very much for that, Natalie. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Pam Duncan Glancy for questions on this theme, and she will then take us into our third theme, which is round about meeting the targets after that. Pam. Uh, thank you, convener, and, and thanks again to, to everyone for your answers so far. Um, kind of following on um, the themes that we've been talking around um, intersectionality, um, and specifically a blog has been published um, that you might be aware of this week by Close the Gap. Um, that, that highlights some concerns that I share um, about the delivery plan. It says that this was a time for building on the actions in previous child poverty delivery plans and applying increased focus on women's poverty. Instead, the sharp focus on women's poverty is diluted within this plan. No actions explicitly designed to address the disadvantages of women in the labour market beyond a vague commitment to continue t taking targeted action on the gender pay gap and continued reliance on pre-existing strategies and interventions which are not well gendered, including no one left behind and individual training accounts and the Flexible Workforce Development Fund are throughout. This, this is obviously quite concerning given the focus that we've had this morning already on the need to address women's um, equality and in particular in the workplace. Um, and I think all of us around this table um, and, and, and on the panel um, agree how important this is. What could we specifically do um, now to, to kind of redress that, that imbalance and make sure that, this is, um, that, that we progress the work that the previous plan started um, on women's equality in the workplace. And who do you want to direct that to? Um, I think I could, if, if I could start with Bill um, and then maybe Marion, if that's OK. Um, we could def definitely do more. I, I, again, from the plan, um, one of the things that, that um, is being fluid is that there will be collective bargaining um, for um, both social care and child care providers uh, to try and raise wages in both of those sectors. Now, as those sectors are dominated by female workforces, that, that could assist. And, and as I say, it's not only the number of hours uh, that are in question, but also the low pay. And in both those sectors, um, low pay. Is, is is a factor in uh, women continuing to be in poverty, even although they are in work. And, and those areas, as we've seen, are absolutely essential to the functioning of a modern economy. Um, and, and therefore, you know, the workers in those areas should be uh, rewarded for that. That will uh, cost money, because ultimately, uh, um, the funder, um, you know, <laughs> Who, who provides that funding uh, through local authorities, etc., to the childcare and, so, and social care providers is Scottish Government. Uh, so it has to come out of the block grant. And um, again, there has to be some acknowledgement that there will be costs uh, involved in this, just as there are 
in ensuring that everybody that secures uh, a Scottish Government con contract through the procurement uh, process will have to be a living wage employer uh, going forward. So that, that commitment's in the delivery plan as well. So there are commitments there which will help raise wages of some women workers. Of course, we would like to see more. Um, as I say, I think there's a welcome acknowledgement in the plan of um, some of the intersectional aspects of, of um, poverty. Um, but we would always look for more. Um, you know, we could agree we close the gap. You know, that, um, a gendered analysis is important, as, as in fact, as, is one which takes into account disability, given, given how large a proportion of the, the children living in poverty, 40% of those children are from households with a disabled parent or, or child in them. So, you know, we need, we need to see more uh, work in that area to analyse uh, the figures we've got to make sure that the actions that are being taken around employability are actually meet, you know, meeting the needs of the target groups and assisting them to move out of poverty. So that's that's why we called for that greater analysis, and we we've begun to see it, but we need to see more going forward. Um, a quicker analysis of whether the um, policies and that are being rolled out are actually working in practice uh, to, to assist uh, the groups. And, you know, the proof's in the pudding. If, if we begin to see more lone parents able to take up employment opportunities, then it will have a, have an, a, a gendered impact. Uh, um, so, we'll see. We'll see. Marion, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I this is a, a really important area for us. Um, uh, as Bill mentioned earlier, uh, most uh, single parents are, are um, women. Um, they're actually sort of women in their mid thirties, um, and uh, you know could be classed um, as women returners, which was was um, a term that was uh, used a lot in the past. Um, so uh, absolutely agree that particularly the employability strategy. Um, has to have a gendered focus, uh, which has been lacking. Um, in our work uh, that we've done, research we've done with Oxfam and with J GRF, um, both of these pieces of research found that um, mainstream employability programmes um, uh, are gender blind and um, they, they really don't focus on the needs, particularly of single parents. Um, so, so I, I think we have to see some big changes there, and there, there are some welcome um, kind of um, parts of the delivery plan, which which mention you know a focus on this, particularly kind of single parents. But um, I do agree. I think we need to strengthen the focus on on gender across our whole approach to child poverty. Um, we talk about child poverty, um, but um, to actually tackle child poverty, we must tackle women's poverty. Um, uh, children live um, with, um, you know, kind of with their parents, and uh, most of the the children in the target groups uh, do do sort of live with um, one parent, and that parent being a woman. So, um, I think I think that um, we need an intersectional approach which covers um, gender and disability, um, and um, ethnic minority groups, and. Uh, we particularly need to look at, I think, a gendered approach in, in relation to, to social security as well, um, and in re relation to reducing the cost of living. Um, I mean, there's a whole area around women and poverty to do with domestic abuse. Um, a high percentage of the single parents that we work with have been, you know, affected by domestic abuse or financial controlling behaviour, and it sets the context of where. They're at at the moment, and it links into um, women's homelessness as well. So, um, I absolutely agree that um, yeah, we need to sort of keep a high focus um, and a concentration on uh, women and poverty, um, and then yeah, that will contribute towards reducing child poverty. Oh. Thank you. Um, thank, well, I will just move straight to the next theme. Thank thanks. you very much. Um, and thanks for, for those answers. Um, on, on the targets, I think it is fair to say that 
that if we get there, we're, I think um, some of the submissions say that we're, we're, we'll only just reach the relative poverty target and we'll miss, obviously, the absolute poverty target. And there are concerns about um, standards of living and, and possible um, the, the, also the targets on destitution. On that basis, could, could I ask the panel, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like for so many people that we are in an optimistic situation when it comes to um, the economy or the cost of living. So does the modelling still hold? Do, do you think in a year's time we'll still be saying that we'll meet the targets or is there anything um, that we need to do now to guarantee that we get there, given that the modelling suggests we'll, we'll, we'll only just make it? Um, and what... It, it doesn't, yeah, the, the reductions in poverty, this has already been touched on actually, don't really reflect living standards. So it'd be good to hear a little bit more about what that would mean for families. Um, and if maybe uh, Peter and, and Bill could, could answer that just for, for time, if that's okay. I think everyone could say something on it, I know. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Um, I'll try and be brief on this. I think that there's, it's a real significant challenge when um, when the statistics are telling us, as Bill had alluded to earlier on, when the statistics are telling us that uh, poverty rates are going down, but um, the experience that um, MSPs, the campaigners, uh, grassroots organisations are reflect are hearing about are saying something different. How do we square that? Um, so I think that I, I think we need to be really um, cautious about the modelling. And I think even in even in the the papers that the Scottish government have presented in the annexes, there is a degree of caution uh, and a lot of caveats to those uh, to the models that have been produced. Both the, the sort of standard caveats that are in any modelling um, about changes in the external environment, uh, in terms of the the broader economy and so on. And I know just this week we're getting. Um, uh, Predictions that the economy may go into recession later this year. So, so I think the I, I think we need to treat those uh, predictions with some degree of of caution. Um, and I know you're speaking to Fraser Valander and GRF and IPPR, and they they will no doubt have more to say on on the robustness of the modelling that, that certainly I can't talk about. But I think what what that caution around the modelling tells us is that we need to. We need to be listening to um, people with direct experience of poverty in a more consistent fashion. It was one of the things that was said. There's lots of, or there's some references in the plan to um, to lived experience panels in, in different areas of uh, of work that's been developed in the plan, and that's good. But I think what we need is a very clear sense of how we can take what we're hearing through lived experience, which is that things are getting tougher. Not that things are getting easier, um, and apply that to our policy responses. So whether that's in uh, what we do around uh, the new benefits that are coming online in Scotland, and thinking about the the value of those and the adequacy of those, or thinking about some of the um, crisis responses that are available. So the role of Scottish Welfare Fund and so on is is having that more real time feedback. Um, we know that the the, um, the big data sets that tell us are we going to reach our child poverty targets are are not going to be robust for for the next little while. They weren't robust enough this year to report on. Um, so we need to treat those figures with some caution, and we need to think about how we use other sources of evidence to tell us whether we're in the right direction or not. Thank you. Do you want to hear yeah. from Bill? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, just just very quickly because I think Peter said it most most of what I'd want to say on this. Um, I do think there's a real danger um, if we trumpet from the rooftops the relative poverty target has been achieved while forgetting the other targets. And I think the material deprivation target is the one um, that's going to be missed um, probably by quite a large margin, um, and um, that's a really important one because. During the first year of the pandemic, 50,000 Scottish children um, went without a basic necessity, either without food on the table or energy to heat their homes, or in fact, with a roof over their heads. So that's the first year of the pandemic. We think it got worse in the second year. We're not sure yet, but we're waiting on the figures. But it looks as though it could probably got worse. 
if if that continues and and the, the rise in energy prices, the rise in food costs, and an even greater rise is predicted uh, because of the war in the Ukraine. Um, if if that continues, then the impact on those families is going to be severe, um, and and you know, real destitution uh, will will occur, and you. Know, for those families feeling that, and for the many, many families on middle incomes who are going to feel the pressure, it is not going to feel as though things are getting better. It's going to feel as though things are getting worse. So there's going to be a real dissonance between you know, the lived experience that's there um, that tells people that things are much, much worse, and, and the official figures which tell them that poverty is falling. Um, so we, we need to treat it with more than a pinch of salt. Um, yeah, the modelling may well be correct, or it could be slightly off. Uh, we could just hit the target, or we could just miss it. But for the real people at the sharp end of poverty, poverty is deepening, and probably we are going to see people living in poverty for longer. Um, and and that's again, that will have lifelong consequences for those children because it will impact on their health impact on entertainment, um, et cetera. You know, poverty is a cycle, and we want to take children out of that cycle. Thank you. Many thanks for, for that um, answer, Bill. Um, we're going to now move on to theme four, which is round about warm, affordable homes. And before um, I pass to my colleague Miles Briggs, I'd actually just like to ask a question myself. Um, and it's round about um, those children who, you know, are, are within the Gypsy Traveller community. And we know that we've got £20 million pounds set aside over the next few years to actually address um, their accommodation needs. Um, and we do know that they do experience some of the most harshest forms of, of poverty that is enduring. Um, and I wonder, perhaps, um, Bill, if you could maybe touch on, on this aspect of um, how we make sure that, that we manage to address the poverty of, of these children who sometimes experience um, the, harsh, the harshest poverty that there is. Thank you. I, I think it's very difficult. I, you know, I worked briefly with the Gypsy Traveller community back in the 90s myself. Um, I know that accompanying that poverty goes uh, a stigma. Um, that, that, that those children experience um, at school um, and in the wider community, um, you know, and the discrimination that that community faces. So it, poverty doesn't come on its own, like old age doesn't come on its own. Um, and uh, you know, the stigma that those those children experience um, is scarring as well um, as their poverty. Um, I think there's going to be particular difficulties. We've gone into some of the aspects of rural poverty, and, and that affects uh, the traveller community to, to a great extent. Um, but also, you know, uh, and I'm sure Shelter can, can comment on this to my much greater knowledge than myself, but the, the, you know, there's less places for, for traveller communities to, to settle um, and, and stay temporarily um, while they travel. Um, that's that's been an aspect that's, that's been occurring over the last few years as well. So, you know, I, I, I do think we, we, we often concentrate on the numbers. I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. You know, the, the numbers from, you know, households with disabled people, households um, headed by a lone parent. But, um, you know, the, the poverty experienced by some of the, the, the smaller groups, uh, black and minority ethnic communities and, and the travelling community, um, is even more intense and, and much more likely to to experience that. So, we need we need to concentrate on the need and not just the numbers. So, the needs of those communities have to be addressed, um, and there are very specific needs around education, housing, uh, energy supply, etc. That uh, travelling communities are, are going to experience um, because of the economic situation as well as as poverty. But also the discrimination, as I say, that, that's still there, um, unfortunately, uh, in many in many places throughout Scotland towards uh, travellers. 
Many thanks for that, Bill. And I wonder, um, Alison, if you could perhaps come in here and, and maybe speak a little bit to whether um, our rapid rehousing transition plans and our ending homelessness together action plan combined with this £20 million that's there to, to help tackle um, the shortage of, of accommodation for the travelling community, um, in, in your estimation, is actually going to, to get us to where we need to be. Thanks very much, Elena. I, mean, I really uh, understand the points you're making. I would agree with Bill's comments about the amount of marginalisation and discrimination that Gypsy Travellers experience. When Shelter Scotland did some work with the uh, communities across Scotland uh, a few years ago, I think it was very stark that um, there was actually quite high housing costs in terms of some of the local authority sites, but the standards were pretty poor. And as Bill has alluded to, the supply on those sites was a real issue. So I think you know, that th there's a real need for action there. I think a more general point in relation to what you're saying about the joint Indian homelessness together plan and rapid rehousing, I think we're at a stage where we're beginning to identify some examples of good practice that local authorities are, are driving forward. But I think we're really very far away from a coherent programme where we understand what does success look like and how do we build on that where are the gaps and barriers and what action is required um, to take that forward. And I think that's a general point, and I think it's also true of parts of the Ending Homelessness Together plan that relate to specific communities. So I would uh, include care leavers in that, people leaving prison, etc. I think we're seeing, as I say, pockets of good practice, but that is not a coherent programme that's anywhere close to reaching the targets and indeed matching the aspirations that were originally set out in the Ending Homelessness Together plan. Thanks very much for that. And I think that probably alludes to the fact that it takes us full circle to that mainstreaming equalities agenda that we need to make sure that we embed it at every level and, and, and every area that we work. Um, I'll hand over now to Miles Briggs, who will follow on this theme, and then Natalie Don. Thank you, Convener. And my questions um, follow on from uh, your initial question there, because I wanted to ask with regards to um, children in temporary accommodation specifically. Um, I personally feel that the child poverty delivery plan uh, lacked action in that area. Over 7,500 children in Scotland today are living in temporary accommodation. The time children are in temporary accommodation has doubled. Um, so I just wondered what your view was on how we need to actually see that area looked at again within the plan, um, especially as an Edinburgh MSP, I have to say the situation here is in crisis, really. Um, so I'll maybe bring you back in, Alison, and if anyone else wants to add anything in, on that topic. Thanks for that, Miles, and, and the opportunity to offer a contribution. And Judge Scotland absolutely agrees with your concern. We've got record numbers of uh, children in temporary accommodation, 7,500, as you say. And also, we've got a situation where we, we keep adding to that. So every 19 minutes in Scotland, another household becomes homeless. By the end of today, an entire classroom of 32 kids will have become homeless. And as you say, length of stay is a real issue. So if a family becomes homeless today, on average, it will be the 28th of March 2023 before that household is offered permanent accommodation. Now, the fundamental problem here is the lack of supply of social homes that are required to move people effectively and rapidly on from temporary accommodation to permanent offer. And I think, and it's come up in a number of contributions so far, I think housing and action on housing is a key structural change to end the cycle of child poverty. And I think making sure that we are achieving the housing supply targets the Scottish Government has laid out in Housing 2040, making sure that we do that at pace. And I think that goes back to something that Bill said at the beginning of the, the, the conversation. Pace and scale and investment are absolutely key here. And I would also pick up on what Peter said earlier on as well about the need for consistency and longevity as we take action on child poverty. It's the same in terms of taking action on the housing emergency. We need to see long-term cross-party support because where we are now, um, we are very far away from even reaching the, the affordable housing supply targets of the previous parliament. Those targets won't be met before September, and they weren't on target even before the pandemic. So I think it's understanding where are we being successful and how can we build on that, but what is the evidence telling us about what the barriers are, what the blockers are, and making sure that we take consistent and long-term action to, to ensure that um, housing supply is truly on target. Thank, thanks for that, Bill. I know you want to come in, and just in the interest of time, I'll maybe um, 
just ask this question before I bring you in with regards to um, what changes need to be made then to the affordable housing supply programme. Um, I think we all agree with some of the steps which have been taken around um, a shift towards pre preventative models um, and that's welcome but in, in this case often um, that's beyond being able to keep people in their, their homes. Um, so I just wondered um, with regards to changes to make sure that that has the maximum effect on, on child poverty targets um, around that uh, model as well. I'll bring you in, Bill. Um, I, was, I was just first of all going to address the last question, which was um, ar around you know children uh, and families having to stay in temporary accommodation. I completely agree. We need we need we need to massively reduce the numbers that are in temporary accommodation for any length of time. I think that some of those families have ended up there because of the benefit cap. Um, so addressing um, the, the problems caused by the benefit cap, because it leaves families with insufficient funds to pay their full rent, they then get into areas and are evicted. Um, and, and when they're evicted, local authorities place them in temporary accommodation and then find it quite difficult, often because they're large families, um, to, to rehouse them. So um, you know, if, if we that is a preventative measure now, which I think will feed through and hopefully prevent families ending up, some families ending up in temporary accommodation. But absolutely right. We need to see your know, housing strategy and, and affordable housing plans um, take into account that lived experience. And, and again, there's some uh, indication, again, that, that uh, particularly the needs of larger families will be addressed. I do think we need to see more um, more spelled out about how grants to uh, registered social landlords um, will be improved so that they can build those homes for larger families and build more accessible homes for families with dis disabled uh, parents or disabled children. Um, you know, yeah, families, uh, you know, disabled people are more likely to live in um, uh, social uh, housing, um, but you know, a fair proportion do live in the private rented sector, which isn't always suitable for them. Um, and if we had more affordable um, social housing, then um, you could reduce some of their housing costs and again move some of those families out of poverty and provide them with much more suitable accommodation. Because you know. We've seen, um, sorry, I, I work for a disabled people's organisation in my day job. I've seen um, people coming out of hospital and put into uh, first, second floor flats when they're wheelchair users. Um, we know lift up and down, so they're, they're essentially trapped in, in their flats. Um, so, you know, more affordable but also more accessible accommodation is, is absolutely essential to. to Addressing some of the problems with, with child poverty, um, poverty in Scotland is around uh, two percent lower than in, than in uh, other parts of the UK because we have a, a more social housing uh, supply, a greater social housing supply than than other parts of the UK. Um, but we need to see it improve even further, um, and, and I'm sure that Shelter and other organisations are working very, very hard to, to achieve that. that. Thank you for that. And just finally, I wanted to ask with regards to children in kinship care, um, if there's any specific um, asks around, around them. We know that there are different support payments, for example, being provided by different councils. Um, and just wondered if the panel, any members of the panel have any view with regards to um, how children could be supported in who are living within a kinship care arrangement. Anyone want to come in on that? If not, happy to move on. Move I mean, I, I do know that there are um, issues with regards to housing for children that you know are in kinship care. Sometimes, especially when they, they need to have adaptations done or the house is not suitable for for those children. And I think that that probably feeds back into the, the answers that we've heard from some of the other questions. Um, but I do recognise that it might be a question that maybe nobody in, in the panels able to answer at the moment. Um, but thank you for bringing it up today, um, Miles, because it is important. Um, I'll hand over um, to Natalie Dawn, who has some questions on this, and then Pam. Natalie. 
Thanks, Convener. Um, yep, so in terms of the policies themselves that are included under the Warm Affordable Homes, do the panel feel that they have enough of a focus on tackling child poverty? And obviously, we've got um, funding from Home Energy Scotland, for example, that are going to provide £42 million in grants and loans to help with making homes warmer. However, we are now seeing um, what appears to be an ever-increasing cost um, of living and increasing fuel costs. To what extent do we feel that this, any these policies might be counteracted by that? If I could put that to Alison, please. Thanks very much. Very much uh, appreciate and understand the question. And I think it goes back to some of the things that Bill was talking about. We have a, a, a general problem about how high housing costs are, are a major contributing factor to, to poverty. And um, we know that 170,000 children in the rented sector, that's private rented sector and social rented sector, 170,000 children are living in poverty after housing costs. And I think, as you say, we need to think about housing costs, including rent plus the cost of heating that property. And it goes back to the point um, I was making earlier about what investment is going to make, make sure that we're building the right homes in the right places to end the housing emergency as a structural change to end the cycle of child poverty. And I think by right homes, we have to be building homes that meet the highest standards of energy, energy efficiency as a major contribution towards tackling fuel poverty. But we're hearing very clear messages about how the costs of that are accelerating very fast. So I think we need to look at um, recognising the situation that the, the investment that's on the table from Scottish Government at the moment will inevitably build less homes if we want to make sure that we're keeping up with the target, but we're also keeping up with the target around energy efficiency. So I think in terms of the pace that we want to see homes come on stream and the kind of homes with that high standard of energy efficiency as a contributor towards reducing total housing cost, we need to look again at the amount of investment that's been offered to social home providers to build the right homes that will make the difference. Thanks very much, Alison. I don't believe anybody else wants to come in on that, so <clears throat> I will move on. Um, just obviously, we, we've I know there's the part that the panel have mentioned a, a, a sort of um, emphasis on more and increased and warmer social housing, um, more affordable housing. But do you does the panel feel that there are any other uh, measures that could address child poverty, poverty that are missing from the plan? in relation to, to housing. Um, and I will put that one to Bill first, please. I think it's, it's going back to you know, seeing more joined up thinking across policy areas. We, we do welcome the, the fact that there does seem to be um, you know, much greater thought given to how different uh, policy portfolios across government might contribute to reducing uh, child poverty. And I think this is one of the areas um, where there, there definitely needs to be more action taken in, in the future. If we are moving towards a just transition in net zero, um, we do not want the cost of that to fall disproportionately on those on the, with, with the lowest incomes. In other words, your energy costs could rise <laughs> the, uh, due to a just transition. Um, as we try and eliminate carbon, um, um, and, and you know, Alison's already talked about um, improving, let's say, the energy standards of the, of the homes being built, uh, that will increase rental costs, et cetera, unless we, unless we improve the, the grants to uh, social housing providers. But there's also areas here where we're talking about energy production. Um, through wind farms, et cetera, other you know, renewable forms of energy. Um, I would like to see you know, greater investment in community ownership of, of supply um, and, and reducing energy costs directly because uh, the local communities actually own the energy supply and supply it to themselves first rather than the national grid. Um, and and re therefore, re now this happens in Europe. You know, it's not unheard of. It's not mad. You know, uh, scheming or anything like that uh, that we're talking about. We're, we're simply saying, you know, if renewable energy is there, and if we can tap into it through wind and solar power or wave power, um, then surely the local communities where that is happening should be able to benefit from that. Um, so, you know. Let's see 
whether you know some of the issues around land reform, where we've set up funds um, that communities can tap into to buy um, your know, local uh, assets uh, and, and land, etc. Whether that could be extended to energy production and, and seeing local communities actually begin to own uh, their own energy supply and, and benefit from that and lower costs to themselves, because we're going to have to do something in the longer term to reduce energy costs. They don't necessarily, because costs don't come in, energy costs aren't factored in to the, um, the relative poverty figures, at, at least, or the absolute poverty figures, but we do need um, to, to see them uh, being addressed, because otherwise, um, you know, families are going to be faced with the choice, not only whether they put food on the table, but also whether they can pay the rent. And if they can't pay the rent, they'll get evicted, etc. And the costs then are enormous to the families and enormous to, to the public sector. Because, um, as, as Miles will tell you, the cost of putting up a family in temporary accommodation for a week can run into thousands of pounds. So, you know, it, it, it makes no economic sense uh, to allow families to get into that situation. And yet, at the moment, um, with the rise in energy costs, if they are not addressed, there will be families who are, who are forced to make the choice of eat or heat, or, but also whether to pay the rent or, or, or uh, pay the electricity or gas bill, and, and one will go. And if that happens, um, they could end up evicted, homeless, and then a huge, huge issues for, for those children. Absolutely agreed, Bill. Um, and I have real concerns for people that are on like key meters who don't even have the option to not pay the electricity bill. They're just going to completely go without. It's, it's, it is scary. Um, my next question, actually, does the panel feel that if renewable energy was generated in Scotland, was not sold back to the national grid, but instead remained in Scotland, would that benefit householders? Again, you have just asked that, so I have no further questions. Thanks, convener. Thanks very much um, for, for that question and those answers. And before I hand over to Pam, I think, Bill, you've, you've really outlined just um, the, the stark reality that we're facing and the need that we look at housing to 2040. We look at the outputs from the Social Renewal Advisory Board. We look at how um, we're going to decarbonise and those district heating systems, perhaps, that are going to be in the offing, but also how does the draft national planning framework for in 20-minute neighbourhoods and all of this actually link all in together to, to address poverty and specifically child poverty. So there's, there's that golden thread that we need to pull together. So I'll hand over to, to Pam and then finally on our last theme, um, I'll hand over to, to Paul McClellan. So Pam. Thank you, Convener, and, and thanks for allowing me to come in again. Um, on, the, on the district heating thing, um, some of you will be aware of the experience of residents in the Windford um, in Glasgow and the, the fact that they, they have created a, a system, or there, there was a system there, um, for them to benefit from energy created on their doorstep, and it was supposed to reduce uh, fuel costs um, and also uh, heat their homes, but that's not happened, and in fact, um, some of those costs are now increasing. Um, so it'd be interesting maybe to hear from, from Alison if possible um, what, what we can do to make sure that where where that where community energy systems are put in place that they definitely do um, begin to bring down fuel poverty for um, for households. Um, and then the just um, another question while I'm on um, for, for Alison as well. Um, I, it just feels like the, the, I mean the real message of build social houses in the right place for um, that are the right size with the right um, amenities round about them just seems so so clear and, and, and absolutely the answer. What what is what's stopping us getting there? Why why are we not doing it? Like what, what's happening? Uh, thanks very much, Pam. And I maybe just start by picking up at some of the points that I thought Bill was making so well there. I think it's it's understanding how acute the situation is and, and obviously part of the backdrop that we're now struggling with is the cost of living crisis. So we're seeing rent arrears go up. Bill's rightly pointing out that's going to be a big driver of homelessness. We're already seeing homelessness go up. We know that 57% of families in Scotland are worried about keeping up with their rental costs already, and I think that's only set to get worse. And I think, as Bill was saying, in terms of taking a joined-up approach, it's also appreciating the very high cost of, of, of accommodating families in temporary accommodation, but also the very high costs to local authorities of evicting families. Now, we did research last year which showed that, and this was a conservative figure, the cost per family of eviction was about £15,000. We, we spent £28 million evicting families from social accommodation. Now, I think there's a, a legitimate question there about 
what, what's the best way of using scarce public resources to drive the greatest positive outcomes? And I don't think it's about evicting families. I think we've learned a lot about eviction during the pandemic. I think we took a very progressive approach in Scottish governments to be applauded for that. But I think there's there's a danger of missing the opportunity to lock in that learning and lock in that progressive approach and really ask ourselves in a very robust way, in what circumstances should a family ever be evicted from a social uh, rented situation, particularly if they're going to be evicted into homelessness? So I just wanted to kind of make those specific points. I think in terms of the delivery of social housing, I think we were starting with the Affordable Housing Supply Programme of the previous Parliament. We were starting from a dead stop. We hadn't been building social housing at anything like scale for decades. So we're still having to make up for those decades of underinvestment. And in those decades, the capacity to build had gone. Now, I think we've built up some momentum. But as I said earlier, the Affordable Housing Supply Programme of the previous Parliament is yet to meet its time. I'm not seeing the analysis which enables us to understand the question I think you're quite rightly asking, which is where are the problems, where are the barriers, what do we need to do about that? And I think critically we do need to make sure that we're resourcing local authorities and social housing providers to deliver. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking social housing providers and local authorities in particular to do more in the context of our national ambition to end homelessness, but you can't do more with less. And I think in terms of what we understand are the very real challenges around supply chain, around uh, rising costs, that the cost of building a social house has dramatically gone up, but the level of grant has not. So we're in a situation, as I said earlier, where the amount of investment that's going in, great though it, though it is, is not good enough because it's going to now build less. So I think it's taking the Housing 2040 target 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, 70% of those, 77,000 for social rent. Good targets, but we need to understand in detail how are we going to deliver on that so that it doesn't remain an aspiration because family needs, families need bricks and mortar solutions. They don't need broken promises. Thank you. You, yeah, Pam? No, that, that, that's my final question. Yep. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over now to Paul, who's going to ask the last few questions. Paul. Th thanks, convener, and thank you, panel. I want to move on to talk about levels of, of investment, and, and I suppose it's, the narrative, I suppose, is which policies are likely to have the greatest impact on child poverty, and if budgets are tight, where would you prioritise spending? I, I want to ask Claire uh, this first question, and Claire, I remember meeting Save the Children to discuss about your report. It would be nice to just feel secure where you laid out and put out your, your um, you know, I suppose, impact and where you think the, the priority should be around about. So probably that question first of all to, to yourself and I know in the conclusion you mentioned about there's about six or seven different things you've mentioned but where would you prioritise that and where do you see the greatest impact? Thanks very much for that question. Um, I think as, as you point out our report um, with parents looked at their priorities and what they wanted to see in, in, in the action plan um, and I think there, there's lots to welcome in the plan so um, social security um, is obviously absolutely key to supporting families uh, incomes and looking at building adequate incomes in the longer term as well as supporting those immediate costs now and I think the plan is, is is probably strongest there in terms of having very specific deliverables. And that investment is so important. We know that increasing incomes alone has a direct impact on children and family well-being and, and their outcomes. So, so we really need to make sure that that is a priority in our spending. Of course, Social Security alone um, it won't meet the targets and support families, but it's really important. So one of the other areas that we're really uh, pleased to see um, recognition throughout the plan is the, the importance of holistic family support. We know how important that is to families. So that linking up of practical, emotional and financial support uh, makes a real difference to families. So the fact that that's been recognised um, throughout the, the plan, I think, is really important and will be key to how we deliver uh, support for families. I think what we now need to see is how is that going to be delivered? How will the funding be 
uh, supported and it's really important that we focus on that delivery and make sure that that's focused on what families need uh, and that's what drives it. Um, I think as well um, the investment in the transition fund and um, the employability support is really important. That's been touched on already by others, I think, in the evidence, but that's a clear message from families that that transition moving into work is a real crunch time for families. There's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of fear, um, and being supported through that transition, both in terms of practical support, whether that's reducing barriers or access to childcare, transport and other areas, but also that emotional support of that change, of the uncertainty of what it's going to mean for family incomes, moving from benefits into income is, is really, really important. So that really holistic uh, and person-centred continuous support is going to be really, really important. So I think in terms of those kind of key areas and drivers, um, we're really, really pleased to see that. And, and childcare as well. We've talked about that already. Investment in delivering further commitments on childcare is key on this as well. And we really, really welcome um, the steps that have been outlined or the promises that have been made on childcare. Again, it's about ensuring that that's delivered. Um, it's delivered at, at pace and scale um, and with the investment that, that we've, we, we've talked about as well. Um, I think there's a couple of other areas in the plan where um, the parents mentioned and highlighted that maybe there isn't a strong uh, a plan around. So um, debt was one of the areas that consistently comes up for families. And I think the impact of the cost of living crisis, unfortunately, we are going to see a significant rise in debt potentially. And thinking about how we support families to manage that debt and prevent it is going to be really, really important. Um, so I think we'd want to kind of make sure that we have um, investment and support available to all families that, that need it there. Um, and then we haven't talked about Part C of the plan today in terms of the, the sort of prevention. Um, it's really important when we think about meeting the targets that we're thinking not just about achieving them in 2030, but how are we going to sustain low levels of child poverty from 2030 onwards? What does our society need to look like? So really pleased to see that those preventative elements of poverty are included in Part C. I think there's lots to welcome in that. But again, it's about making sure that we've got kind of the specifics and the, and the deliverables there, because we know that focusing on income as well as the well-being and sort of family outcome, uh, children and families' outcomes together is going to be critical to preventing poverty in the longer term. So really thinking about that long-term plan, and that does require investment in uh, tackling the attainment gap, um, thinking about how the plan links with the promise um, and, and looked after children. I think it's great to see those being connected up a bit more in the plan. I would say in relation to Part C, one of the other areas um, that we that maybe isn't through is isn't included as strongly as we would like is the early years um, and thinking about how we're supporting families and children with very young children, uh, particularly when we look at some of the priority groups, um, families with babies and under ones, that's a particular um, group with very specific needs, I think, that we need to think more around. And a lot has happened. Uh, a lot of support is already in place. We have made significant progress, but we're still seeing very high levels of poverty for that group. So I think it's really important that, that we look there and think about beyond early learning and childcare, how we support um, parents uh, how we support families uh, with the youngest children. Um, so I think those would be our kind of top level um, analysis based on what kind of parents said needed to be in the plan. Claire, thank you for that. And I know you've referenced the first 1,001 days as being vitally important, and I think that that's key. I'm going to try and bring Marion in, if that's OK, convener, in terms of a couple of things that you mentioned in your submission. One, obviously, was about a financial inclusion pathway. And we've heard about parental transition fund. So, just Marion, just to get just what your thoughts are, obviously, on, on, on the priorities and so on. And the one kind of thing that Claire's kind of mentioned to me as well, maybe open up beyond that, was obviously around about the debt advice, because I think that is vitally important about how you deal with that. One is prevention about when people get into debt, but how do you prevent it in the first place? So, I think that's incredibly important. But, Marion, can I ask you that question first of all, around about, as I said, the financial inclusion pathway and the parental transition fund? But also then maybe ask the panel to talk around about or think around about the debt kind of thing that Claire brought up. Claire, 
Marion, over to yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I've got yep. you now. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, that particular part of the plan around the transition fund, we, we, we really do welcome because um, the research we have done around this um, it has shown that this is, is really a big issue um, for single parents in relation to um, you know moving I think into work they, they can actually be be worse off and there, there's a lot of the reasons around that obviously there's the upfront child care um, but um, what we have actually found is that um, because we do in our services we've embedded financial um, advice within them is that um, we've done some case studies which show that, um, that, that there are cliff edges in terms of the benefit system. Um, so that when single parents and probably others move into to paid work, that they actually lose some of the help that they had when they were on benefit. Um, so for example, help with school meals, help with um, uh, school clothing grants. Um, some of the parents lost these, um, the, the, the kind of, um, the COVID payments, um, and so I think uh, it, it is worth a careful look in relation to, to sort of um, the impact of that. Um, I, mean, I think what our survey has shown is that really the parents that that that, that kind of that consulted and sent us in uh, the information um, about their lives shows that they are in crisis and. Uh, you know things like um, one parent said, "My my work asking me to return. They're asking me to return to the office, but I don't have I don't have um, the money to pay for the fuel for my car. Um, I'm choosing between you know kind of um, eating my home and being able to eat. Unfortunately, a lot of the the, the, the messages coming through from, from parents was that they themselves were not eating. Um, they're eating what their children um, have left on their plates." Um, They've lost so much weight, weight. They can't afford to buy new clothes. Um, they're going to. We talked about this, just, you know, uh, earlier. Moving into rent arrears. Um, they're struggling to keep their prepayment meters topped up. Um, so, so one parent's, you know, got five kids, and they're having, she's having to walk them all to school because because she doesn't have have money for the fares. Um, so I think there's like going to be a tsunami of debt, um, and. Uh, I think we already have a huge debt crisis, but I think um, we, we need some emergency action. I think you know. I think um, we need to look at things like uh, the, the, the the you know kind of the, the the tapers for access to to school meals and school clothing grants. We could look at that right away. Um, a lot of parents, when they move into work, they lose that, and so their income goes down. Um, I think we really need to look at um, the Scottish Child Payment. Um, and uh, that you know, is that enough? The increase enough that that has been put on the table? Um, we would argue we need the emergency action for that to be increased sooner rather than later. Um, there's things like Best Start Grant and these payments to to, to families with younger children. That, you know, Claire's mentioned um, they've been increased, I think, by six percent. Um, but inflation is predicted to be eight percent. So. Even those are not keeping um, keeping um, uh, kind of in, in pace with, with with inflation. So um, yeah, so I think I think it's crucial in relation to debt is to to sort of have this integrated, embedded into the family approach that that um, Claire talked about. You know, kind of fat, you know, kind of the that's mentioned in the child poverty delivery plan, uh, holistic family support. Um, we have to invest more in this financial um, inclusion, support, benefits, advice um, for that to be embedded, um, kind of you know within that. Um, but what I would say is that the survey we've just had back uh, is incredibly um, frightening. Um, I have to say, of the two hundred odd parents that have replied to us. Are in a very desperate situation, and um, so I think um, anything that Scottish government can do um, to reduce costs and to put money in parents' pockets, um, you know, you know, really is vital. Thanks, Marion. I don't know if anybody else wants to come in, convener. Um, no, and, and we'll need to wrap up. But Marion, I think that that's a very important um, note for us um, to wind up this session on. And what I would say is, 
um, the committee does have an inquiry um, on problem debt and poverty, and I'm sure some of you have already submitted responses to that. But if there's anything you feel um, on that that you would like to follow up today in writing, that would be most helpful. Um, so thank you very much to the panel for, for joining us this morning. And I will suspend briefly for a short comfort break and to allow the other panel um, to get into place. So thank you very much.
Welcome back, everyone, and sorry, uh, sorry for that short delay. Um, I welcome to the meeting now our second panel, which focuses on public policy research and analysis addressing poverty. And I welcome along Jack Evans, Scotland Policy and Partnerships Manager at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Philip White, Director of IPPR Scotland, and Emma Congreve, Knowledge Exchange Fellow at the Fraser of Allender Institute. Um, I'm going to invite members to ask questions in turn on different themes. Theme one is round about child poverty trends and the economic context, and I'm going to bring in my colleague Miles Briggs first. Miles. Thank you, Convener. Good morning uh, to the panel. Thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Um, I wanted to um, open this session by asking whether or not you felt that the um, delivery plan does enough to drive down um, cost of living issues. Um, I'm happy to open that to anyone who wants to start, maybe um, yourself, Emma, to, we can test your link. <laughs> of course. Um, good morning. Um, so, in terms of the actions in the plan around sort of the immediate issues around the cost of living, I don't think that the plan was written um, in order to really fully address those issues. Um, so the plan is written in order to seek ways to meet the targets in the interim targets and the final targets. Um, and it is potentially um, you know, an issue that it doesn't more include more actions that deal with the, the issues around the cost of living in the here and now. But then on the other side of the coin, you know, was that what this plan with the, the longer term focus that it has? Um, is, is that what we should expect this plan to be doing? Um, so I don't think it, it does it, you know, the actions required um, that could be done by government to, to, fact, to, to address the issues that are very present at the moment. I don't think, I don't think you would argue that the plan addresses those um, fully. Um, but uh, as I said, I think we have to um, remember what the plan is 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 there for, um, and it's not necessarily to to deal with issues um, sort of that are very short. That, well, they'll be short and long term in, in some of the consequences, but it's it's potentially not the best place to be dealing with. Thanks for that. Does anyone else want to comment on that, Jack? Hi. Yes, yeah, so I would agree with Emma that the, the yardstick I'd measure this plan by is probably not its ability to hit the cost of living crisis. Um, but we are in a backdrop of collision of increases to really basic function, uh, basic things for, for, for families. So um, it is it's a completely valid question, but I think what this plan is clear in its kind of strategy and its overall the kind of overarching theme is to increase uh, incomes and resilience to maybe future shocks. So I think that's probably the, the where I would um, judge the plan. And I, but yes, I, I would agree with Emma that this isn't really set out to reduce the, the cost of uh, drive down living costs. Thanks for that, Jack. And Philip, can I bring you in? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I say too much to add now that um, Emma and Jack have covered it. I think cost of living crisis is, it is an, it's a crisis, it's an income crisis issue or a cash crisis issue, and that's actually quite different from longer term issues of poverty. And in fact, actually, it was a risk of the country heading into recession. We know from previous experience that actually recessions can do quite strange things to poverty, um, and you can perversely actually see poverty start to decrease during a recession if everyone's income starts to get pulled down, particularly against or primarily against the headline measure of relative poverty. So I do think it's important to keep the two separate two issues separate and focus on the long term. But I absolutely agree. I think you know, we at IPPR have been clear that the short term measures that we have seen, you know, particularly in terms of council tax payment measures, have definitely not done address had not done enough to address, you know, immediate income crisis that the lowest income households are facing and certainly a real risk that what it has done is spread quite scant resources far too thinly. So I think there is an immediate pressure to address. We know those immediate pressures can have long-term ripple effects which do start to affect poverty. 
and that's where we would expect to see the measures in the plan start to kick in, rather than necessarily address that immediate crisis staring us in the face now. I think there are separate measures that are required to be taken forward, not in the plan, that are required there. Thank you for that. Um, the delivery plan does include, I think, a welcome focus on employability. And so I wanted to ask, uh, with regards to forecasting and um, around the labour market, and you've touched upon um, recession, potential recession um, already, Philip, um, what prospects there are for parents trying to look to enter employment or seeking, seeking to further increase income from work? Um, so I'll, I'll maybe start again with Emma and then bring everyone back in. Thanks. Yes, thank you. There is a lot of of, um, of, of uncertainty, as um, as economists like <laughs> saying, around many of these issues. Um, we still don't fully understand what um, the the period of the pandemic has actually meant for for the labour market. Other than um, you know, things were nowhere uh, uh, turned out not to be as bad as feared in terms of numbers in employment. Um, there is a, an uncertainty about what that's meant for quality of work and for the kind of working conditions for people, particularly on lower incomes, and, and how that will develop in the future. I think the cost, the issues with the cost of living around um, issues like fuel um, and actually potentially um, the, the sort of with, with costs rising so much, I think people who are in um, constrained financial situations will be kind of, you know, sort of trying to contain that and to not take on any additional sort of risk that if they're just about holding on to their situation um, and are very uncertain about what's going to happen to costs in the future, for commuting costs, childcare costs, eating costs, then that kind of ability to take, um, you know, jumps into the unknown, potentially uh, changing jobs, um, looking for progression opportunities or, um, you know, going into, into work after a break. I think that understandably people are feeling a bit kind of paralysed, I think, because of, of so many uncertainties at the moment. So I think, um, I, I mean, I, I do appreciate that the plan obviously ha focuses on employability and rightly acknowledges it as a as a um a very important driver of tackling child poverty um, but added together um i don't think the the plan really addresses that kind of day-to-day -day reality for people having to knit together um issues around commuting issues around childcare um issues around kind of you know um, being able to access different um, employment opportunities, training, skills, development. I think um, there's there's a lot mentioned in the plan, but actually, I feel that um, there isn't. It hasn't been knitted together in the modelling, and I feel that potentially it doesn't knit together in reality for for many um, parents who would would benefit from the type of things it talks about. It's just maybe falling short a bit in terms of that comprehensive package that will make a difference on the ground. Thanks. Um, can I just drag one to come in? Yeah. Philip. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the prospects for parents entering employment, I probably wouldn't base my assessment of that on the economic forecasting. I would probably have a look at the past and current performance of the priority groups when it comes to priority family types, when it comes to labour market and uh, in-work poverty rates. But overall, I'd say so the, the, the plan correctly analyses the fact that we need to shift some of the weight of responsibility of reaching child poverty targets from Social Security and onto, um, onto work for those that are able to work. And it recognises two sides of that coin, that we need an employability offer that gets people into the labour market, but we need a labour market that actually works for people. So I think the former part of that does that does the employability offer in the plan that do what it says on the 10, we can probably come back to in, in other sections. But in terms of the labour market they're entering, 
uh, for their prospects. I think if you look at some of the groups, such as minority ethnic communities, you see the con 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 consistent difference in outcome um, going compared to the rest of the economy, well, the rest of the labour market. So you've got uh, an ethnic minority pay gap. You've got um, white workers on average performing better in terms of how many hours they're getting compared to how many they want, and also a, 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 just a general employment rate. Um, so aspects of this plan should be looking at how, how to remove those kind of structural barriers if they exist as well as like get people into the labour market. And I think that would also be true of the single parents, but in, in a completely different way. We know that single parents are less likely than other parts of the um, priority families to be in, in work, and that's a, kind of a reality of having one parent in the household and childcare responsibilities and everything else that goes along with that. So a different kind of offer for them needs to be made so that they can be productive and, and succeed within in the labour market. So in terms of your question about prospects for parents entering the empl uh, employment, I think the plan recognises that the existing labour market and our existing economy doesn't offer a huge amount of hope for any different results than we are already seeing, which is high levels of in-work poverty and, and different barriers faced to, to priority groups. And Phil wants to come in, yep. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think just in terms of kind of the wider context, you know, I think particularly post-pandemic, as Emma says, we'll need, it will be still a while yet before we see the true impacts of it. At a macro level, you know, I think headline, it, it's been broadly positive that you've seen that employment actually has fared quite well. But actually, you need to dig beneath the detail of that and you need to drill down. And actually, what we've seen is the fact that despite that positive trend in the overall rate of employment, it masks really significant inequalities within the labour market. And so you see wage inequality is higher now than 40 years ago. The nature of work has changed in terms of more part-time workers, a big rise in solo self-employment and zero hours contracts. And you know, most pressingly for poverty, you've seen stagnating real earnings. So it's at that lower level issues that you know that kind of the battle against poverty is going to be fought. And I think, as we'll probably come back to, I think the feeling is that while the delivery plan makes positive noises towards that, what we're really lacking right now is a level of detail that actually shows quite clearly how you can start to tackle those inequalities within what might on the surface look like a labour market going in the right direction. And ju just finally, could I ask, um, are you aware of regional um, divergence and differences um, within Scotland um, around opportunities or level of, of um, parents who are able to access employment? And do we have any data specifically on, on you know, Edinburgh in the South East, for example, which has continuously been growing even through the pandemic? Emma, I don't know if you have any data on that. It's maybe something we need to look at, and if you could write to us, that would be helpful. Happy to, to write to you with, you know, with some actual facts and figures on that, but I think it is important to, to, to state that, you know, poverty is not, um, you know, it's, isn't, it's, it's everywhere. It's in the whole of Scotland. It's, it's, there may be more of it in some areas due to um, some, some local dynamics and, and labour markets, but it's 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 as present in Edinburgh as, as it is in, in 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 most parts of of Scotland. It's just uh, different experiences. But I can certainly write to the committee with some more detail on that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thanks very much. Um, I'll move on to questions on theme two and three, which Pam will start us off on. So round about evidence base and modelling and then round about coherence and targeting. So Pam please. Thank you, convener, and thank you. Good morning, or good, yet still good morning, um, to to the panel. Thank you for the evidence that you've submitted in advance, um, and for all the information that you shared with the committee and others um, today on this issue. Um, and I take the point that the plan isn't written as, as as a cost of living plan. However, it is written in one of the biggest cost of living crises I think any of us will ever live through, or I hope it will be the biggest any of us will ever um, live through. And whilst it, it the the modelling suggests that we will meet the initial relative poverty target um, only just but but nonetheless um, we, we, we will get there it doesn't feel like that for people on the grounds things don't feel 
optimistic at all. Um, to, you know, it doesn't it doesn't really meet the sniff test, I guess. <laughs> like it's it, it's just not quite right. Um, in in the panel's view, is the modelling op optimistic? And given that the, the circumstances that we're hearing from individuals um, living in poverty and the experience they have right now, do we think that in a year's time we'll still be saying the same thing about um, possibly meeting the targets? Um, I, I think I'm sorry. I think anybody could probably add to that. I don't. I don't know if I, I want to target it specifically. I'm going to go with Emma. I'm happy. I'll take oh, the hit on, on this one. What a, what a way to start. Um, I think you know. Previous IPPR Scotland analysis, I think it's shared across kind of essentially all three of our organisations. So certainly, you know, either who's optimistic and who's pessimistic, I think even using those words might be a bit loaded. But um, certainly ours has been more pessimistic or the government's has been more optimistic. Um, I think at the end of the day, I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head that ultimately, ultimately a, a model is only a model, you know, it, it is a computer simulation of what we think the world will look like in a year or in this case, you know, three years time. It will never be infallible. We certainly will never say that ours is infallible. I don't think and hope the government would say that theirs is. Um, I think in terms of the next year, two years, as a we don't know what the world will look like in a couple of years' time, not least if we do hit a recession, as I said earlier, actually that can do really weird things to poverty. There could be really negative impacts on the actual rate of poverty, or again, as we saw um, in the seventies, eighties, and nineties, overall, it could actually perversely bring poverty down if everyone's income comes down with a recession. So, I think a model can really tell you so much. It tells you where you can potentially have the greatest impact. We know that whether it's right or wrong, optimistic or pessimistic, both IPPR, I think JRF and Fraser Valander would agree, and Scottish Government would agree. We clearly know that in the short and immediate term, Social Security and direct cash transfers are going to have the greatest impact. Well, that's four or five, six percentage points. That's where you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck and what's going to have to do the heaviest of the lifting to meet the interim targets. So I don't think further increases can be off the table if um, it seems that we're not going to meet our projections. And I suppose most importantly, you know, the only way that any projection ever comes true is if you actually deliver the things that you said you will, and at scale and at pace that is required. And I think that's where we really need to see further details come through in our delivery plan, not least around the employability schemes, but actually getting those schemes getting benefits, getting payments, getting services in kind out to the families who will benefit quickly and at the scale and the pace that they need is going to be absolutely key. And if you don't do that, you will never meet any kind of projection, whether it's optimistic or pessimistic. Thank you. Um, Emma would like to come in on this one. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say that we are doing a lot of work on this. Um, alongside JRF and Save the Children, actually, to, to really understand um, the modelling. Um, we only got sight of it when everyone else did, so it takes a while to sort of recode <laughs> things and try and, and, and do that work. But hopefully by June, we, we should be able to have a clear idea. Um, and I mean, I would, I would like to say that on the modelling, I think it's um, we would all benefit from a lot more um, understanding of what it can and can't do and um and i think that it's right that it show it what it's very good at doing is showing us the scale of the impact of certain measures so um the scottish child payment is is responsible for most of the of the projected fall in child poverty um and you know so a lot a lot rests on that um but it also is a version of the world that's been modelled that doesn't take account of the um, any sort of lasting impact of the pandemic, which, as we previously mentioned, is still um, to be kind of uh, understood fully. Nor does it, it include, um, as you rightly say, the kind of the, the potential kind of scarring impacts of, of the cost of living crisis. So it's it's based on a world that we know is is going to be very different. Than what has been modelled by 23-24, so it can only give a, a very kind of um, and sort of a it's, it's almost like a best guess of where we think we're headed, and um, but relying on on its 
um, accuracy to the last percentage point, I, I, I don't think is a very good idea. I think it, it probably gives us um, a good idea of the trajectory um, given policies that have been put in place. So Scottish child payment, as long as nothing else comes along and changes everything, <laughs> and we just had a pandemic and, we're, and huge increases in the cost of living, which could significantly change um, the trajectory, um, you know, not due to government policy, but due to things that are happening um, outside. So it's it's, um, it's a useful exercise to model these things for, to understand the scale of policy, but um, we can't rely on it to tell us whether or not we're definitely going to meet um, the targets. It just gives us an idea of if we're heading in the right direction. Can I also bring Jack in, who would like to respond to this one? Thank you. Um, so I think Emma thankfully covered the kind of the, te the more technical side to the of Pam's question, but I think um, and, and, and pointed out that Jeff will be responding with Fraser Valander and Save the Children by the summer in some detail about our opinions on the modelling. I think the other part of Pam's question was about that, that kind of sniff test and about what does it really mean if if someone is telling if someone is saying we're going to meet poverty targets while they're watching their their prepaid electricity meter kind of plummet as they cook their roast dinner or try and turn their heating on? And I think what that kind of for me speaks to is about like the way that we kind of use data and gather insights. So we need to be much more reactive in a, in, a, in moments of crisis than we have been over the last couple of years. We've relied on poverty statistics that, by their very nature, are obviously not real time, and they, there's a lag on them anyway. That feels less appropriate at a time when, but the in, inflation doing what it's doing and cost of living um, increasing. So, speaking with organisations that are working directly with families that are going through these crises is, is going to be even more important for Scottish government than ever. Uh, understanding if there's in spikes in in areas that are demanding in food bank. Use or, or homelessness, uh, homeless uh, accommodation, having a kind of a collective like understanding of the picture of what's happening in poverty and in, 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 in destitution is going to be really important to making sure that this tackling child poverty delivery plan is not just getting us to the targets, but responding to the actual need of of children in poverty and, and, and families in crisis. Pam, do you want to go on your second yeah, theme? Yeah. Please, thank you. Um, that that's all really helpful, um, and I think there there is a real challenge in there for us to to see how how do we gather that information, how do we find that intelligence, um, and then use it to um, to as you said uh, react quickly in a time of crisis, which um, I think we we absolutely need to do. Um, can I can I ask um, Jack maybe just a further question on? Um, some of the actions in the plan, and could you could you say how much action do you think there is in there to address poverty from the priority groups? So I think what the plan does is that it has a welcome focus on the priority groups, and most of the actions seem that that I would focus on probably in in part part first part of the the plan in terms of increasing incomes from from work. Um, it understands that um, for for incomes to, to to be increased for the priority groups, that we need a new employability offer. It's uh, uh, but and it also understands that we need a new kind of uh, what I think what's referred to as a transformed economy. All of that is welcome, and all of it reflects the evidence that's in Annex Six that is kind of heavily points towards those are the actions to do. What I don't think it quite matches up is in, in those bold actions that are mentioned in, in the foreword to the report. I'm not sure what the single offer to parents on, for employability is. I'm not sure if the, the new money is, if the, the £81 million is new money or where, where, where it's from, and I'm not sure how the parental transition fund is, go, is going, going to work. All of those are the right ideas to have, the right diagnosis of the problem, but I'm not sure that the um, solutions outline, are, are outlined in the in the plan explicitly, and, and the plan does say that it will work with others to kind of come up with with that offer. But my, I would echo what other people have said this morning: is that that, that rapid iteration needs need, needs to be forthcoming because we are, 
you know, halfway through 2022 for these child poverty targets to be met. If we are creating a new employability offer, that needs to get off the ground uh, very, very quickly, and it needs to be targeted in a way that I think previous employability offers um, have been said to, but we still don't have evidence of whether that's worked or not. So, in terms of actions to uh, re uh, reduce poverty, I think it's got the right ideas, but probably not quite there on on the practical steps that are going to be taken, which is the most important thing. Um, and I think um, we'll be work looking forward to working with Scottish government and directorates and all on uh, across the across the on all the political parties to to make that work. Thank you. Um, can I just have one quick follow up on that as well, please? Thank you. Um, that that's really helpful. And, and I know as as ever, you, it'll be, people will be unsurprised to hear that uh, I, I hope the pace and scale um, moves quickly and that the actions um, do do follow to meet to meet the ideas in it. Um, on on the point of addressing poverty of the priority groups, um, close the gap. Have published a blog this week, um, and in that in that blog, they've, they've said that they feel that this plan is 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 a re is a regression in terms of a gendered analysis and women's poverty. Um, do do the panel share that view? So, oh, um, so I've seen the blog from uh, Close the Gap, and I would uh, agree with a lot majority of it. I think that if you look at uh, the, the last tackling child poverty delivery plan, there is explicit mention of the inextricable link between women's poverty and child poverty, and that was peppered throughout it. And I think that is not. It is in the evidence in Annex Six, and it's in the Annex Seven in terms of um, the uh, in terms of the evidence there. But what it's not is it's not written into the plan as boldly as it was last time. And I think for any strategy, if you don't have it, what you want in the core part of the strategy, you're probably going to miss it out in the core part of the delivery. So I was quite slightly disappointed not to see it more explicitly mentioned in the childcare aspect because we know that. Um, the, the the report uh, the the delivery plan talks about parents access to work being improved by childcare. I think we know explicitly that it's around about eighty percent of those who are um, not accessing the labour market are, are women. So it's a it's a women's um, poverty issue there. But also in in terms of uh, there, there's, there's just not there's just less uh, like I say focus on, on it as there was. In, yeah, it does read like a regression. I don't know if that is purpose or, or, or an oversight. Uh, and the last thing I would say uh, is that there it, there is a part, there's a, several other strategies pointed to within the, the delivery plan um, that allude to working with women. So like uh, the gender pay gap refresh that's that's coming. So maybe it will all be in there, but I would have, I would have hoped that um, it would have been actually in the plan um, that was produced three weeks ago. Can I just briefly bring in um, Emma and then Phil on this point, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Emma Roddick for a question on it. So very briefly, please, because we are still got questions to go and running out of time a wee bit. Of course. Um, in terms of the, the priority groups, and I think this links to the, the point about um, um, the gendered analysis, I think there is that retained the, the priority groups within the analysis. Um, but I do, for, from the analysis point of view, there is less that kind of picks up on the specific issues faced by priority groups and addresses those um, directly. And I think if, when you do that, you, you, you do go very um, quickly into um, appreciating that, that women are, um, you know, the sort of disproportionately affected by the issues that um, are thrown up in the priority groups, from lone parents to mothers of, of large families to young mothers to those with babies. So I, it's 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 good that the, the priority groups are still recognised. I do um, think maybe there's um, there could be more focus on on actually explicitly um, addressing those issues um, you know, rather than. Um, there's one section, I think, on transport where it's you know it just kind of says, you know, 
people in poverty use buses therefore this will be good for all the priority groups because all of them use buses <laughs> you know it's it's not quite it's, um, i'm not voting properly here but um that's sometimes the the impression it gives it's it's um it's there's there's a lot of catch all in there that will affect all of the priority groups but maybe not that focus in terms of um, what the priority groups specifically need, and, and as I say, I think that lends itself to to, to picking up better some of the gender um, issues that are, are prevalent within that. Thank you. And if we could and, go to Phil, yep. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, so we know that when you look at child poverty, if you're not in a priority group, there's somewhere around about ten percent. I think going off last year's stats, compared to thirty percent, if you're in one or more priority groups. Like that huge disparity shows you that your starting point should be how do we design and embed policy that specifically and explicitly targets the priority groups, not how do we design a generic policy and then look after the fact about the benefits or impacts it's had for priority groups. It does, however, feel that sometimes there is a rush to generic policy, which we look for the after the fact benefits and there isn't enough focus on actually designing policy right at the very start that has very explicit goals and abilities to be able to explicitly get to the priority group. So I think ensuring that they are embedded in policy from the start is incredibly important. Thanks very much for that, Phil. I'll move on to a question from Emma Roddick. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, I struggle, as always, with the contradictions in our hybrid social security system. Um, so the Scottish Government wants to give money to parents to help tackle child poverty. It wants to help those same parents into work. Um, it relies on universal credit, which is a reserved income-based benefit to provide the data for who receives Scottish child payment. Um, is it possible to do both of those things when universal credit says you're in work, so therefore you might lose your benefits. Um, essentially, I'm, I'm asking, can these policies to ch tackle child poverty be as effective as they could be while they're being delivered under a hybrid social security model, which is led by two governments that, that do have fundamentally different ideologies? And I suppose that that's probably for um, Philip and Jack. But I think it is. Like, I think our starting point will always be not what are the limits of devolution settlement here and now, but what are its abilities and how do you test and stretch that as much as possible. That may ultimately lead you to reconsidering the devolution settlement, seeking further powers, whatever else. But that's not the starting point. I think it can't, you know, it can't be the starting point. Or I don't think it should be the starting point for an issue like this. So, I mean, I think you've seen the Scottish child payment that there is an ability to be able to use the powers the Scottish Parliament has, and it's an incredibly important, progressive, and you know, really welcome ability to do that. We know that there are risks that come with that in the fact that you create a double cliff edge for families, and that as soon as, to an extent, as soon as they lose their UC entitlement, they then in turn lose their Scottish child payment entitlement, and in fact, all the other um, benefits and payments that are reliant on UC eligibility as well in Scotland. There are obviously alternative and different powers available to the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament does have the ability to create wholly new benefits in devolved areas. That's clearly incredibly complex and difficult. It's why the design of Scottish child payment, and I should declare an interest as one of the civil servants at the time that designed the Scottish child payment, but it's why it was designed in the way that it was to be able to use that data that was available um, to quickly get a benefit out the door in the form of the Scottish Child Payment. But other powers are available, essentially, you know, so they are still open. Where I think we really haven't nailed it yet is actually in what we do, as you say, for people in work. So while, Scot while First Art Scotland has been devolved, that focuses in a very specific subsect of people that are long-term unemployed and um, have a no health condition. So there is that question of what do you do about that much larger group of people who may be accessing UC, who are accessing a DWP job centre, that are essentially shut off to the Scottish Government and the ability of Scottish Government programmes to kind of really get them right from the minute that they walk through the door. And I think the starting point has to be trying to get the two governments to work much better together. You know, we've seen the heel dragging and the issues that have arisen around trying to get data out of DWP. But I think our starting point is 
a huge fanfare was made when these powers were devolved. There is a need for the UK government to ensure that the Scottish government has everything that they need to be able to make them work. And I think we'd expect both governments to work much more closely together to be able to do that, ensure that really, you know, it's a dry, tacky, boring area. But something like data sharing agreements are incredibly important so that you're able to identify and pinpoint the cohort of people that you can provide the greatest support to. And I think that's somewhere where we're still potentially a little bit behind the game. And Jack, did you want to come in on that? Sure. Um, probably just a couple of brief points on it. Um, it was welcome that, well, no, firstly, this, the existing settlement between the benefits um, between the two governments existed at the time of the targets were agreed. Parliament, there's not a big difference in what, what what was happening then and now. So that would never be a reason that, that the Scottish government were, were, are not able to meet the child tackling uh, meet the child poverty targets. Having said that, um, it couldn't have been a clearer contrast on the day that this plan was announced. The day before that, this, the Chancellor. Um, just basically abandon those on low incomes in this spring statement. You've got one day abandonment of, low, of, of those on low incomes, and the next day you've got Scottish government targeting a payment to those um, who need it most via the Scottish child payment. Um, and those actions will put uh, child poverty on a downward, a downward trajectory. Um, but it's also just worth noting that in the forewords from Cabinet Secretary, there was no mention of uh, of the, this kind of the, the the difficulty between the UK government and Scottish government, which I think is is welcome because there needs to be an acceptance that Scottish government does have significant powers and, and does have um, that, as Philip was talking about, the, the ability to create new benefits as it has done already. So, I I think I completely get get the point because there is such a contrast, but I think it's probably not the um, wouldn't be a wouldn't be the the focus of of GRS approach on this. Many thanks, um, Jack. And I'll now move on to our last theme. Um, and our last set of questions um, are going to be from Natalie. Natalie. Thank you, convener. I'll keep this quite brief because a lot of my uh, questions have, have been answered already. Um, does meeting the 2030 targets require a radically different approach to that taken to meet the 2324 targets? And does the panel believe that the concept of a minimum income guarantee or a universal basic income um, would be a feasible option which the government could explore to tackle poverty in terms of affordability and effectiveness? Um, so I'll put that one to Jack first, please. Hi, thank you. Um, so. Uh, Quite a big question there. I think what I would probably like to do is talk about the the, the big action to get to the twenty thirty targets um, first. So I think this plan doesn't probably get us doesn't get us to twenty thirty. This plan gets us scraping towards the interim targets for child poverty to be reduced as significantly as is needed to, to meet the targets. We will need. To an economy that looks significantly different from the one that we have today. We'll need um, people to be in jobs that are flexible, um, well-paid, good jobs. Um, that doesn't feel like the labour market that is open to, to many people at the moment. There is a lot of work that the Scottish Government can do to support that, but there's a significant amount of work that employers need to do to support that. More decisions that affect um, people on that side of the, the issue will be made in boardrooms than committee rooms in, in, in this parliament or, or in Westminster. So getting employers on board with this national mission is a, is a, key, is a key task. It's referenced in the delivery plan and it's got a £800,000 budget put, put beside it. Um, but I think um, it can't be underestimated how much that, that is needed. Uh, we had the National Economic Transformation Strategy published not too long ago, which also tried tried to look to that. I think there was there's quite big gaps that were due to be filled in that strategy, in this strategy, but have also then been passed over to the Fair Work Nation strategy that's coming in summer. So we'll have to wait and see and see if that will deliver in a pathway to this transformed economy to reach the 2030 targets. 
Um, I think the the other the, the 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 questions you asked about minimum income guarantee, I think, might be best going to to Philip on that, who sits on uh, some of the working groups on minimum income guarantee uh, for universal basic income. Um, I'm relatively agnostic about its its uh, ability to end end poverty. I think there's some quite terrifying numbers about how much it would cost um, to, to implement at a level that would um, actually make any difference to those in poverty. Um, I think that there's a number of levers that can be pulled now that would make a bigger impact today to people in poverty than a, another discussion about the minimum uh, the, about universal basic income. And I think it's also the reality that you can probably do a minimum income, uh, a universal basic income, without you know some quite massive. Uh, relationship changes between the UK government and and, and, and Scottish government. Um, however, in saying that, I think that the examples in Wales of a u universal basic income for those uh, who uh, are children who have experienced the care system is a really interesting concept. And I think that kind of idea could be applied in this sense to perhaps some of the groups in the priority groups um, that we think that perhaps work isn't going to be the the way that. Poverty is solved. So basically, the families of babies that are in, in poverty, you know, that could be a cohort of of people that, if we were looking at universal basic income, and it wouldn't be obviously universal, but a basic income guarantee, it would be interesting to look there. Um, so that's kind of uh, where I would be at on it. Thanks, Jack. That's uh, very helpful. I, th I think for me, in terms of the universal basic income, we've obviously got a real focus on employability for this. Um, but I think it's important that, that families that are in poverty are still going to be able to actually see their children. And I think a universal basic income would perhaps open up a bit more flexibility. Um, could I pass that, that question on to Philip next, please? And then I'll come to Emma finally after. Thanks. Yeah, of course. So, just in terms of 2030, I mean, it's a very simple no. Like, it will not help us to meet the 2030 targets. You know, we need to lift 210,000 children out of poverty between now and 2030. Um, and the government's own analysis says that essentially the decrease between now and interim targets essentially flatlines in the years thereafter. Um, and they went out to 25, 26. Now, again, we have no idea what the world will look like across the rest of this decade. But it's very clear that further work is going to be needed. Fair work needs to be a really big part of that. Again, maybe the commitments in the plan do start to deliver that. Certainly, 12,000 parents into work every year, which is the stretch aim, isn't going to achieve it. So it's going to need to go further at a far greater scale. But I think obviously we'll want to see what at least, at the very least, the initial outcomes look like of the um, commitments in the plan just now to know how to build off those at scale. But again, what we're lacking right now is detail. Um, for our work has to go absolutely hand in hand with a minimum, minimum income guarantee. That's certainly been the focus of IPPR of Scotland's work, and obviously it's now the focus of the Scottish Government, given that they've established the expert in steering group. I think that offers an opportunity to fundamentally rethink the welfare state. It's about saying that there is a common standard of living that everyone should be able to reach, and actually it's a, it's a standard safety net that is there to catch everyone. You are absolutely right that a minimum income guarantee is not just about a cash transfer. It is not just about a level of income that you try to get everyone to. What it also needs to go alongside is how do we rethink the world of work, ensuring that people have good, secure, stable, well-paid jobs. It means that they are able to find that right balance between you know, home and work life, which we know that particularly for lone parents, single families, um, again, those you know, right at the right at the cutting edge of poverty are actually most likely to be in that type of insecure work where they're facing a horrific juggle between home and work um, balances. So it's where childcare needs to kick in, it's where that wraparound support essentially needs to kick in, which I think again we are lacking at a scale that is necessary. And alongside that, obviously then universal services. So the potential is there. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination, not least in kind of you know the further transfer potentially of powers that would be required, the work that would be required with the UK government. But I think the ambition is there from the Scottish government. Obviously, through the steering group, we're looking at in great detail just now. I think it's one that you know I think we've seen these types of groups kind of tail off. Um, 
once the kind of true scale of cost and complexity becomes apparent, I think this is one where we can't allow that to happen. You know, this presents a hugely transformative opportunity for our society, and I think it's one that we are going to need to see come to fruition kind of across the rest of this decade if we've got any hope of meeting 2030. Thank you. And finally, can we hear from Emma? Thank you. So, I, I would um, echo a lot of what Philip has said there, and I think we should look to the words of the people who've written the plan in in, in terms of what they think about the 20, meeting the 2030 targets. And, and Annex 4 says explicitly that, you know, um, the reduction for 2030-31 is unlikely to occur without considerable changes to the drivers of poverty. So, um, so yeah, there's there's no question that a lot needs to change um, in order to meet those targets. I think if um, we are thinking about options that, ex that exist in terms of universal basic income, um, minimum income guarantee, you know, obviously they have their pros and cons, but I think one thing that um, that strikes me is that what we we should be aiming for is to enable choice for parents so that income doesn't constrain the choices that they're able to make. So um, if their needs are that they need to um, that they need they want and, and 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 to go and work, they should be able to do so and not be constrained by their lack of income that, that constrains their choices. Um, one of the issues that we found in our analysis of universal basic income is that it can kind of um, put people off um, and you know universal basic income provides your income so you don't need to work but actually you know that that um, that kind of embeds poverty potentially if especially if the amounts aren't enough to, to really give you a good standard of living so I think actually your focus very much needs to be on opening up options um, in the labour market so that you know people who are on higher incomes have, have, can make choices as to whether and um, how much work they're doing and um, because they can bring in their childcare, they can afford to do that. They've got choices about travelling and commuting that people on low income don't have. And, and actually enabling that feels like a much um, feels like a place where the, the current plans are lacking. Um, in terms of the details we've talked about and the kind of and the, the what the society, what government is offering as a whole in, in order to enable that. So that I think feels like the right focus for for the next um, the next plan, um, and uh, alongside that around um, cost of living and, and housing costs, which I know you covered in the earlier session. Um, you will see the as is the other fundamental area that that that. that didn't quite, yeah, the current plan didn't quite cut it in terms of having um, the full offer probably required for, for 2030. Thanks, Emma. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our witnesses this morning for their evidence. Um, next week, the committee is going to begin taking evidence on its inquiry into low income and debt advice. Um, the meeting will now move into a private as agreed earlier in the meeting. Um, thank you very much. And I suspend the meeting briefly. Thank you. <laughs>